Bruce McConnell with Locomotive Systems Training. Welcome back. Uh, we are still talking about air brakes. We're going to talk about the equalizing reservoir system. Well, this is LST dash, excuse me, LSTV dash 039. Wow, 39 videos. It's amazing. All right. Let's take a look and let's talk about the equalizing reservoir circuit. All right. We're in the equalizing reservoir circuit charging position. But before we get going, in fairness to this system, we have to take a moment and go way back in time. In fact, one of the first videos, if you looked at them, was that we talked about the brakeman on top of these uh, cars. And they would run, you know, the engineer would honk the horn, and the, the brakeman would literally run from car, car to car to car on top, and either turn the wheel to apply the brakes, or, or turn the wheel or some lever, whatever, to release the brakes. And that was, at best, very dangerous, and at worst, probably very hazardous to their health. So the railroad industry says, you know, we need to get these brakemen off the top of those cars, and we need to come up with a system, an air brake system, that will do a better job, safer job, and, and, and be more effective. So along back in 1869, they came up with a, what they call a straight air system. And it mainly composed of, let's see, we had a main reservoir tank, kind of what we talked about here. But, but uh, let me back that up. That steam locomotive, back in 1869 mainly consisted of, of like six pieces of rolling stock you had a locomotive steam locomotive you had a locomotive tender that had either wood coal fuel oil whatever and you had a caboose so three of those six vehicles were non-revenue vehicles in other words they didn't make any money with it that actually was a cost but but in, but but in lieu of that we still had three cars i mean my right numbers we had three cars it'd be a boss car tank car flat car whatever we could put stuff on that and go from point a to point b and we're making money in the railroad industry now to get the brakeman off the roof what they did is this brake system they actually had a steam driven air compressor because remember we had up here on the top left side just on the last video we had an air compressor up here well modern day they're either ac driven which is standalone they don't need a shaft or the older ones back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, they still were shaft driven, and that air compressor would, would turn from, be, uh, produce power from the engine. Now, the problem with that was, was back in 1869, they had a, a steam driven air compressor, then that air went down to a main reservoir tank to be held for consumption by the air brake system. You had a valve. Just a, just a valve, open, close, and then when you open that valve, that air would flow down to the brakes and would apply the brakes. Much, much better system than what they had with the guys, the brakemen up on the roof. The only problem was there was a lot of problems with that system. If the air compressor was pumping high and the main reservoir tank was high and full of air, they'd move the handle, the brakes, the air would go down the brakes and the brakes apply, and they turned out really, really great. However, if the air in the main reservoir was very, very low, the application would be made and the brakes would be very, very sluggish or wouldn't be very effective at all. So they didn't have a standard uniform braking until much, much later in time. Many, many evolutions of the air brake system came along from 1869 to present day. She's present day, we have electronic air brakes and, whew, you know, we still have pneumatic air brakes, but they all premise off the same theory of operation. Now, so one of the problems they had back in 1869 when they applied the brake, if they moved the handle too abruptly, then the air would flow down to the brake cylinders, and then the air that was designed to keep the brakes applied would ricochet back in the air brake system and literally knock off the brakes that had just applied. So they needed to come up with a better system. So back, I don't, I don't even know exactly what date the, air, the equalized reservoir circuit was created, but they did create it. And what that is, is all the components we're showing listed here. Now you look at this and you're like, wow, that's a lot of stuff, but not really. And let me explain that. In the equalizer, and this is even on modern freight train locomotives back, built back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and there's still a lot of them around. Let's take a look at the component list. Everything that you see in this dashed line right here is all the components, and it says right here, all components in the dash box are located in the 2060 automatic brake valve. So most of the picture that you're seeing here is the automatic brake valve. Now it's not a monstrous huge valve that sits there in the cab of the locomotive. It's a fairly concise condensed package. It's got a handle on it. But that would be one component in the 
equalizing reservoir circuit. You come out of there and you have a P2A brake application valve. I'm talking locomotive built in the 70s and 80s and 90s. We have a P2A brake application valve. We have a 220 cubic inch volume reservoir. I have a 90 inch gauge and then this air goes up and ends there. So for, for drawing purposes, we would draw this pipe here, dark green. And we come into the P2A and go down, the, go down from the regulating valve with the automatic brake valve handle and release. Equalizing reservoir would go into the P2A as pipe 15 and come out as pipe 5. And it will go up to the 20, 220 cubic inch volume reservoir, go up to the 90 cubic inch, excuse me, 90 PSI, equalize the reservoir gauge, and then it will go back into pipe 5 and go to the relay valve back in the automatic brake valve. The cool part about this whole circuit is, is overall it's about 26 feet in length. It's a very stable platform. Handle movement is much more, what do I want to say, much more precise. Maybe be a word I would use. Much more accurate, much more standard, much more dependable. Because now we have a small circuit of approximately 26 feet, and you'll notice it's all confined in these four components. The automatic brake valve, the P2A, the 220 cubic inch volume reservoir, and the 90 PSI ER gauge. Four components in its basic circuit. Now, what happens is, and the reason I gotta show you this right here, you'll notice what I'm doing. With my head, I'm outlining this right here. It's one great big U-shaped, okay? The air goes in 15, comes out five, goes up here. That's charging. Now, that will charge up on a freight locomotive to 90 PSI with the automatic brake valve handle in release. Now, I'm gonna stop right here because we're strictly talking about the equalizing reservoir circuit for a freight locomotive. It will charge up to 90 PSI on that gauge in the control stand of that locomotive. All right, so let's go on a little bit further. Let's take a look at it. Okay, these are the steps that we've created for the equalizing reservoir circuit. Oh look, the point number one, the 2060 automatic brake valve handle is placed in the release position. Boom, all the way back. From right all the way back to left. You're sitting in the engineer's seat, it's right there. The regulating valve, number two, the regulating valve is positioned to charge pipes 15 and 5 to 90 pounds. So we now have established that there's two pipes that are associated with this circuit. There's a lot of pipes underneath that cab floor and also coming down off the automatic and into the A1 charging cutoff pilot valve and the P2A as well as other valves. But we're only concerned with two pipes in that entire system, pipe 15 and pipe 5. And they will charge up with the automatic brake valve handle release up to 90 pounds in freight. Number three, the equalizing reservoir then goes through the equalizing reservoir cutoff valve, which is built in the automatic brake valve at the very base uh, of the automatic brake valve. Sometimes it's a one-way check valve, sometimes it's a two-way check valve, just depends on the cutoff pilot valve. And that's a little bit more advanced, we'll talk about that later. Number four, pipe 15 goes through the P2A brake application valve. In this case, it's acting like a passageway, that's all it is. It's just an air pipe going through the P2A. P2A is doing absolutely nothing, just sitting there. But we have to include it because it's part of the passageway in that circuit. Number five, pipe five goes from the P2A brake application valve to the equalizing reservoir tank. That, that 220 cubic inch volume tank I talked about. And the equalizing reservoir gauge, then to the relay valve with a 26 automatic brake valve ready to go to work. So if you think about it, Let's take a look at the players here of the game. I think this is where we're going to go next. Ha! Ah, it is. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a picture of the 26C automatic brake valve. As you can see, it's, well, I don't know, not very big, probably, eight, 10, probably 10, 12 inches wide and about 14, 16 inches tall and about probably 8, 10 inches thick. Overall, most of that is in, stuck in behind this bulkhead here. That's the automatic brake valve. We're in release and recharge position. This is a cutoff pilot valve, and there's going to be a two-way or three-way. There can be the either in or out. It would be a two-way out freight pass, which this one is, I think, would be a three-way. Okay? Now, the automatic brake valve handle release, equalized reservoir circuit will charge up to 90 pounds on a freight unit, just like you mentioned a minute ago. So that's the automatic brake valve. Move on a little bit. Here's the P2A. That's in our circuit, as I showed you in the diagram, but we're not using it for anything except the passageway from the automatic brake valve back over to the automatic brake valve. So in the equalizing reservoir circuit, that's all this guy's doing. He's doing absolutely nothing. 
but he is part of that circuit, so we have to include it. Okay? Another part, which is huge, is you'll notice here I have a gauge. You know, from 0 up to 160. The red says, right, I don't know if you can read it or not, but it says red main reservoir, which is this needle, red needle barely peeking out. And the white one, it says equalizing reservoir. You can't see it too well, but that, that would be up here. If this engine is running and running correctly, we just started it up. And remember, minimum charge time when you start up a stone cold engine is five minutes. At the absolute minimum, five minutes. Because there's a whole bunch of charging that we got to do. So main reservoir, first off, will come up and charge up to 120, 130 on some locomotives, like I mentioned, or 130, 140 on others. That's where that would wind up if we have however that compressor is cut in and cut out. Equalizing reservoir over here off the regulating valve would be up, if the automatic handles in release, would be at 90 PSI. It'd be right there. Brake pipe on the other needle over here would be matching equalizing, and it would also to be approximately at 90. Now, remember, these gauges are allowed plus or minus 3 pounds for gauge air. And of course, brake cylinder, as we're showing a little bit right here, if automatic brake valve handle and the independent brake valve handle were in release, but remember, you never put those handles in release until you secure that, that locomotive with either wheel chocks and or a handbrake application. You don't want that locomotive rolling away when that when both handles are released and you're going to be starting your, your air brake testing. Make sure that handbrake is secure. Make sure that locomotive will not move. Generator field off. Uh, reverser centered. Isolation switch to isolate. And uh, independent brake valve applied uh, on a J1616 would we'll give you approximately 72 pounds of brake cylinder. And some people even take the automatic brake valve, which I just showed you a minute ago, and put a 20 pound set on top of that. That way they're ensuring that as long as the air engine and the engine is running, that locomotive is going absolutely nowhere, and that's what we want in this situation. All right, so go a little bit further, and there we are. We're at the end. So, we talked about the main reservoir circuit in the last video. This one, we just talked briefly about the equalizing reservoir circuit. Oh, by the way, just so you know, the equalizing reservoir circuit is about 26 feet long, which is what I said, consists of four components, 26 C automatic brake valve, P2A brake application valve in this case is nothing more than a passageway or a pipe. We come out of the P2A, the pipe 5 goes up, goes over to an equalizing reservoir gauge, which I just showed you on the control stand. It also goes over to a 220 cubic inch tank, and that's for proper uh, application and release gradients in that system. And then it goes up to the relay valve in the automatic. That's it. Four little pieces. And here's the neat part. Those four little pieces can actually control the action of a 100, 150, 200 car freight train just with that little circuit. Pretty amazing stuff when you think about it. So, there you have it, equalizing reservoir circuit. There are FRA rules regarding leakage, what you can do, what you can't do. But we already talked about that, I think, in the FRA. And I'll go back and look to make sure whether we did or not. Anyway, so there we are, equalizing reservoir circuit. Pretty simple stuff. And we haven't even moved the handle yet. Equalizing at 90 PSI in a freight locomotive. If it was a passenger train, it would be 110 to give us three full service rate reductions. All right, so that's it for the day. Again, our website for locomotive system training is www. Remember, there are no numbers here. It's www.lst-ca.com. Once again, it's www.lst-ca.com. I hope you're enjoying these videos. I'm trying to make them as entertaining but also enlightening as I can because there's a lot of misinformation out there in the world. We're trying to straighten it all out. Have any questions, give us a call or send us an email. Thank you and have a safe day. Bye.